want to welcome Steve Hogler from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. I'm going to leave it to him to do a quick intro for you, but he's going to be giving us an overview of the Green Bay Muskie Management Program that we've got going on here right now, where we've come from, where we're at today, and what the future holds for our world-class fishery. So everybody please give a warm title town welcome to Steve Hogler. appreciate the uh, invite to come and speak before you tonight and before I go any further I'd certainly like to thank you as a club for all the support you've given the Green Bay Muskie program uh, since even before the inception of the program in 1989. Uh, I certainly appreciate it and all the other anglers of the state that allows us to fish muskie appreciate all the hard work that you guys have put into this program so thank you very much. As it was mentioned, my name is Steve Hogler. I'm the DNR Fisheries Biologist stationed here in Green Bay. I cover the inland waters of Manitowoc and Brown counties, but more interestingly, especially for those sitting in this room, I also manage the walleye and muskie programs on Green Bay. Uh, so what I'm going to do tonight is just give a little brief update of where we are, focusing on our 2018 data collection. And I will have a little update at the end. I didn't know Robert was coming, so I'm going to steal some of his talk, but be nice to him anyway. <laughs> As I mentioned, uh, what I'm going to speak about tonight are our muskie assessments, especially those in 2018 on the Fox River. I'm going to give an update on propagation and stocking, and then talk briefly at the end about uh, some of the cooperative studies that we're working with UW Stevens Point and UWGB. Uh, in general, we do our assessments on muskie on the Fox River in spring and fall. Uh, we time these surveys to uh, take advantage of when we know fish are congregated and we can get all our hands on a lot of muskie in a short period of time. Uh, spring, of course, is our fight net surveys. We use it for two reasons. We use it to collect biological information about the fish and we also use it to collect eggs uh, that ultimately get raised and stocked back here in Green Bay. Uh, fall electrofishing is done in conjunction with our annual Walleye Young of the Year assessment. Uh, we shot uh, both sides of the Fox River from the bay all the way up to the dam and the pier. We shot in the, uh, the lower mile of the Ocano, Peshtigo, and Menominee rivers at all as well. Uh, we're looking for walleye and muskie in those surveys. Once in a while, our biologist in Peshtigo, Tammy Pioli, is able to conduct a spring muskie survey. Uh, she conducts these every five or six years or so. Uh, she targets the Menominee and the Peshtigo River. The Menominee River was done two or three years ago. Uh, she has hoped to do a uh, spring muskie survey on the Peshtigo River last year, but the conditions didn't allow that. Uh, so she is all geared up and ready to go this spring, so we're hoping that we have a more favorable spring runoff, but given the current conditions, that may not happen again this year, but let's hope for the best. And then our final assessment tool for muskie and all the other game fish in Green Bay is our krill survey. Uh, we have approximately four krill clerks that work on Green Bay. There's one in Menominee, there's two in Green Bay, and there's one in Sturgeon Bay that cover portions of Green Bay. They talk to anglers, see what they're catching, and collect biological information on those fish. Um, muskie is one of the species that uh, they've been instructed to gather as much information on as they can. Uh, 2018 was a pretty good muskie year for us in the spring. Uh, usually we set four nets for two nights and we get all the fish we need. Uh, this past spring we did set um, nets for two weeks. <coughs> Two days for two weeks, over the course of two weeks, to try to get uh, fish for Robert Shepherd to tag. So we set those in the water temperature is a little cooler, 50, 55 degrees. Uh, he was able to get the 10 fish he needed in one night, so he was very happy with us there. And then the next week we set our four nets in four locations, uh, fished them for two nights, and we collected uh, almost 77 muskies. 0.4 fish per net night, so we had a pretty good catch rate 
last spring. Uh, the fish themselves were in really nice shape. Uh, females average 50.7 inches and 35 pounds. Uh, males 44 pounds or 44 inches and 21 pounds overall, 47 inches and almost 30 pounds. The largest fish we had this past spring was just shy of 56 inches and just over 40 pounds. This is the second year in a row that we've uh, had a fish 56 inches or larger in our nets. Uh, so the fish are definitely getting bigger on Green Bay. This graphic just pretty much shows the uh, average length trends in Muskie over the course of the last 15 or 16 springs. Uh, the blue line is the males. As you can see, they've pretty steadily increased, although uh, the increase is slow. But the, uh, there is a definite positive increase in length over the uh, time period. Females have, also, females have also increased, but their increase has been a little more up and down. We'll have a couple of good years of very large fish, and then we'll get a few years when the fish are a little bit smaller, and then they bounce back up. Not very unusual. Uh, it's good to see, though, that uh, growth continues to be very good at Green Bay. We don't seem to have any growth issues out there for muskie. While electrofishing, uh, what we try to do is we try to target fish uh, to collect biological information and put pit tags in in fall. Uh, we try to ignore the recently stocked hatchery fish. Uh, so the two length fins that we collect in are fish over 18 inches long, those are red bars, and then fish over 30 inches long, and those are the blue bars. Uh, you, as you can see, through the two, early 2000s, we had a pretty steady increase in the number of fish we saw in fall. This will, will be apparent in a few minutes when I get to the stocking slide. But this is due to the really good, consistent stocking in the early 2000s from Wild Rose. We're stocking about 20,000 fingerlings per year, which is a you know, pretty good rate with a lot of fish out there. Uh, they were found in the Fox River. Of course, you can see the dead years, 2011, 12, 13. Uh, that was probably due to the lack of stocking, 2007, 2008, 2009, when VHS uh, appeared in the Great Lakes system and couldn't bring muskie back to the hatchery. So uh, that was very disappointing in those years. But as you can see, the past four or five years, we're starting to increase again. We're starting to see more <coughs> fish in the Fox River. Uh, we're not seeing the high numbers that we did in the past, but uh, to me that's not really surprising, and it may not be surprising to you. I don't, just don't think as many fish utilize the fox as they did in the past. Uh, we see a lot more angling activity out on the bay in fall and not necessarily in the river. So our data kind of is reflecting what our crew guys are seeing out there with most of the fishing pressure in southern Green Bay or along the west shore of Green Bay in the fall. The question was, is, does the Fox River cleanup impact some of our catches? Yes. It impacts our catch rate for walleyes. It impacts our catch rate for muskie. Uh, there are or have been several years where we could not shock an area that are typically favored by muskie uh, because the dredge equipment was there. And it's very difficult to navigate in and out of all their uh, pipes and dredges and everything else when they're out there, they're out there at night. Uh, so we just avoided those areas. But yes, you're right. Dredging has impacted our catch rate. What was the color story around the uh, river? Uh, <coughs> go back one. Sure. Those are the different sections in the river. We have the river broken up in approximately 20 sections. Uh, we shock these sections every year. We uh, identify them so we can tell what fish are caught in each of the sections. Uh, as you can see, it's, the sections are variable in length. They average about a mile, but there are some that are shorter and some that are a little bit longer. Uh, they weren't picked for any real reason when we set this up 25 years ago. They were picked because there was landmarks on the shoreline that we could see at night. So we knew when we got to the end of the station. Uh, sometimes it's hard to go by GPS and seeing a pier that sticks out there or somebody has a big flag pole. Those are very distinctive things and those are how we set those sites up. So the size of the locations doesn't indicate anything other than we shock in sections and that's how we record our data. 
Well, the Krill survey continues to be a really important tool that we utilize on Green Bay uh, to manage the fishery, whether it's for muskie, walleyes, perch, brown trout, you name it. Our Krill clerks uh, do a really good job. They're out there. They work every weekend, every holiday, and two or three days during the week. They have a morning shift, they have a night shift. So they're out there working pretty hard. They're generally less than favorable conditions sometimes. Uh, what we can do is take all the information they collect and then uh, analyze that data. And that's what these two graphics show. Uh, the top graph is uh, musky CPE, which is blue bars. So it tells us that uh, the catch rate in 2018 was just under uh, 6 hundredths of a fish per hour. So you can do the math, it's like one fish every 30 or 40 hours. Uh, the red line is directed musky effort. So this tells us how many hours people are actually out there fishing for musky. If you ask them, what were you fishing for? They say musky, it goes on that graph. If they say, I was out there fishing for whatever and I caught a musky, it doesn't show up on that graph. Uh, so we can see directed fishing hours declined through the early 2000s uh, into the 2010s, this is probably due to uh, the lack of stocking and fewer fish being put in the bay. And then about 2012, uh, the directed fishing effort just took off. And uh, right now, these past several years, we've been around 70,000 hours of fish directed fishing effort for Muskie and Green Bay, which is very remarkable. Where are the surveys? Uh, our crew plans <coughs> go to Fort Landings. Is this just for the Bay or? That's just for Green Bay. We have it for Lake Michigan, uh, but I, I only pull the data out directly from Green Bay. So they, on, you know, they obviously hit the major boat launches, you know, Menominee, Peshtigo, uh, Gano's Beach, and all the way down here, and then all the way up the East Shore, you know, Little Sturgeon Bay, Sar Harbor, Ship Canal, and then up into the Door Peninsula, that's where our, our Persian Bay clerk goes. So there's probably 20 or 30 spots they go to. Can I see another hand? Okay. Uh, so effort's been increasing. It sort of stabilized. This last couple of years dropped. A lot of that has to do, I think, to the really windy falls we've had. It's been uh, difficult to get out for a lot of people. So, uh, the pro amount of fishing dropped off a little bit, but it still looks to be very good out there. And then the bottom graph shows catch and harvest. Uh, the blue bars are the fish caught, and red is harvest. So as you can see, uh, and I know it's difficult probably in the back, uh, there's only two years in which you can actually see the harvest. We know harvest happens every year. There's a small handful of fish taken, but in uh, 2007 and last year, 2017, uh, we did see uh, harvest in you know, the 20 to 30 number. Uh, some of that is the artifact of the way the data was expanded over or, or what our anglers saw. Uh, so it, it does look like uh, catch is probably averaging about 1,000 or 1,200 fish per year and harvest is about two. It's been pretty steady through time. And right now, uh, with the large size limit on there, uh, it, sure, it does not look like this is going to change very radically. We're going to see a lot of catch and not much harvest, which is we all want. A brief update on stocking. Uh, currently, we use two different egg sources for the fish we put in the Fox River and Green Bay. Uh, the first, first source is from the Fox River. I don't know how many of you have come down and watched this spawn fishing. I know there's been a few people that have been. Uh, we set up at Fox Point, it's usually the second or third week in May. We set our nets, we bring the fish back to the landing. Uh, the hatchery staff is there, they spawn those fish. The eggs go to our egg collection facility in Kiwani, is that me? And they're raised there until they're stocked out in fall as fingerlings. Uh, this has been a very successful program. Uh, it has some pluses and minuses, of course. Uh, the plus is it's a local source. We can get those fish every year. On the minus side, uh, those fish are from a parental stock that 
had a very limited genetic makeup when they were originally stocked during 89 through about 92. So uh, there's perhaps not the most genetic uh, fish out there, but uh, they seem to do pretty well. Uh, the other source is from the Michigan DNR. They collect eggs from the Detroit River. Uh, they hatch those fish, they raise them until they're three or four inches long. They inspect those fish, they get the health certificates, and then we take about 10, 12,000 musky in the fall of the year and we raise them for the next fall. So they're stocked out as yearling fish. Uh, these fish have been truly remarkable. Uh, we've been averaging around 15 or 16 inches at the time of stocking for these fish. So they have very high survival. Uh, the, there's pluses and minuses about this egg source. Of course, they're very genetically diverse, so they're a very strong, healthy population. On the other hand, uh, we have to rely on other states to collect them for us. Last year, we didn't, or, we didn't stock any yearly muskie in 2018 because in 2017, there was a VHS outbreak in, v in Detroit River. Michigan didn't collect fish for themselves either. We can stock any yearling fish. Currently, on the plus side, we have 10 to 11,000 fish destined to be yearling musky in the hatchery as we speak right now. So next fall, we should be stocking some really nice fish. Can you talk just briefly about the broodstock lakes and the, the five-year plan? Okay. Uh, this is our stocking uh, history for Fox River, Green Bay, and the tributaries. Uh, it's hard to believe, but in the times that we started stocking in 1989, we've only stocked about 200,000 musky in Green Bay. Sure seems like there'd be a lot more, but that's all there has been. As you can see from this diagram, most of the stocking is blue, which are fingerling fish. Uh, they survive pretty well because the fish we're stocking as fingerlings are 12 or 13 inches long, which is you know, an appropriate size to stock. Uh, the, the red bars, or the red portions of the bar, are yearling stock fish. Uh, so uh, we haven't stocked that many yearling fish over time, except for the past three out of four years. These are the surplus fish from Michigan uh, that did not need to go into the brood stock lakes. Some of you perhaps remember Kevin Kapazinski. He was me two or three biologists ago. Uh, he did a study and found that for each yearling, stock that's worth 15 fingerlings. So you'd have to stock 15 fingerling fish to equal the return of one uh, a, a one yearling muskie. If you do the math and you stock about five or 6,000 yearling muskie, you do the math, that's like stocking 75,000 uh, fingerlings. And this graph only goes to 35,000. So it'll be up here somewhere. So there's a lot of fish we put in the water in the last few years. Hopefully in the next two or three years, we're going to start seeing some of those fish. In the mid Excuse me? Yes. Yes, Kevin did it from the early years of this program when, in this, from this portion of the data set. Okay. I should mention... <coughs> yearlings we stocked are, we stocked them at 16 and 17 inches long, and that was three years ago. They probably doubled in sales, at least. Uh, there was a question about broodstock. Uh, one of the priorities of the, uh, the fish from Michigan is to stock our broodstock lakes. As you know, uh, in the past we had a single broodstock lake in Sheriff County for a number of reasons that didn't work out. We had a back out and we lost that inland source, which is a clean source of eggs, uh, for us to get fish from. What we did do when we reinstituted this program is we set up three broodstock lakes. There's two in O'Connell County, Archibald, and Anderson Lake, and there's one down in Sheboygan County, Elkhart Lake. Uh, since 2010, we have stocked uh, generally one to three fish per surface acre into those lakes with the Great Lakes Muskie. Uh, we're hoping in the next year or two that uh, the first fish will come ripe and we're going to be able to use that as a source and we'll no longer have to go back to Michigan, except occasionally to, you know, re-add more genetic.
genetics back to the population. As you can see here, uh, 2010 was a pretty low stocking year. We didn't have real good survival at the hatchery. Uh, after that, they tried a few things. They did some habitat projects in the pond. And the past two or three years, we've had really good survival. We haven't had any disease issues. And they've been putting out somewhere between eight and 10,000 fish. About 2,000 of them go to Broodstock Lakes. The rest of them will come to Green Bay. A uh, small number, around 500, have gone to Lake Winnebago. So we're on track with stocking here. Uh, we're starting to scale back some of our numbers. I think we're going to shoot for one to one and a half per acre when we stock this fall. Uh, we don't want to shoot past the safety margin and have uh, issues with the local again. So local again. So we're going to start cutting back in the number we put in the lakes. What kind of information are you getting out of Anderson Lake? Uh, and, uh, go ahead. These are the uh, survey results or the plan surveys in the Broodstock Lake by the responsible biologist. Uh, Elkhart Lake is Annie Dutton. She's relatively new to the state. Uh, she's stationed in Plymouth. Uh, she set uh, nets in 2018. It was a little bit cold and they did catch a few muskie but not a lot. Uh, she's planning her next assess assessment next year, 2020. We're hoping that she actually gets some right fish. Uh, Tammy Pioli in Peshtigo has Anderson Lake. Uh, so far, we have been skunked on Anderson Lake. We haven't been able to catch a single muskie. However, we have had contact with several local anglers that live on the lake, and they have caught some muskie. So we know uh, they're in there. They're just probably not very abundant. And then Archibald Lake, the biologist is Chip Long. He's also in Peshtigo. He's done several assessments and have definitely caught uh, muskie from multiple year classes. So uh, things are looking pretty good in Archibald Lake. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Unfortunately, I know someone on Anderson who said there's a blood so. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good thing. No. Uh, what I'm going to do. It wasn't the right answer. No. One of the things that. Uh, have been really interesting about me, uh, me being here is the ability to cooperate with the universities and their grad students on a number of different projects. Uh, the Muskie project this past year with Robert Shepard has been really exciting. The guys work really hard. Uh, when he comes to visit, you'll really enjoy his talk. He really has a lot of information. But since I didn't know he was coming, I threw a couple of slides in. I stole from his poster session. So we'll go through it quickly. Save up your questions for Robert. <laughs> uh, the goals are very straightforward. Uh, determine the proportion of musky spawning in tributaries or in Green Bay. Uh, proportion that turn to return to known lo locations. Uh, do they spawn once in a while or do they spawn in consecutive years? Uh, what sort of habitat are musky using to spawn? This goes beyond the study that the unit University of Michigan student did uh, back when Dave Rowe was here about spawning habitat. And then uh, he wanted to characterize some of the seasonal movements of musk in, in Green Bay. That's one of the top two or three questions I get. Where are the muskies in summertime? <laughs> and I say, I don't know, because I can't catch it. So don't ask me. You should ask one of you guys. Okay. Uh, what he did, uh, uh, he approached anglers in contests generally or guides and was able to put tags in those fish so we could track their movements in Green Bay. Uh, did anyone here provide Robert any fish? Okay. No, but we did get him in touch with a lot of the guides to get him set up. Right, that's very important. I yep. definitely appreciate your guys' help with that. Um, We've seen him out there, but I just want to catch it. Right. So. Yeah. So, these are the fish that he tagged from anglers. As you can see, they were scattered about pretty much in two locations, Southern Green Bay and then up around Gainless Beach. I uh, had approximately 20 or 25 angler caught fish. They inserted these tags. They inserted two different types of tags in the muskie. Uh, they put in an acoustic tag and then they put in a radio tag. These tags are uh, so they made an incision, put them in the fish, sort them up, let the fish recover, and then release the fish out into the bay. 
They use two different methods. Uh, the radio tags are an active tracking system. You have to go out there with a boat and an antenna and look for those fish to try to triangulate the locations in Green Bay. This will allow us to get uh, fine scale information on where they're spending their time. What sort of habitat are they in? Are they in this bay or are they in that bay? So these radio tags last a fairly long time. So uh, the second suit as that was mentioned will be continuing the work of Robert. The other tag is the acoustic tag, and these are the receivers that pick up the signals from those acoustic tags. On Green Bay, we have approximately 200 receivers scattered around Green Bay. Uh, they're in every river, two or three in each river. There are several curtains across Green Bay, either uh, from Michigan to Wisconsin here, across the Bay to Knox, and then there's one between Green Bay and or the Dork County Peninsula and a Garden Peninsula. So we know are those fish moving north, are they moving east, west, or we're trying to get some large scale movement. These tags are good for 10 years. Uh, they were able to track these fish and it, using uh, these acoustic monitors, they pick those up once a year, they download all the data. There will probably be five or six million data points on each receiver and then they'll sort through looking for muskie because there's other fish out there that have tags in them and Robert or his successor will be able to actually track uh, their movements. It's interesting about uh, the uh, tags that Robert used, the radio tag, is the company that makes them said that you could hear these tags from a plane through the ice. So Robert had DNR plane fly transects, this is a map of his transects in Lower Green Bay where he was looking for muskie. You can do this in the summer if you're in open water. We've been doing it during the winter trying to find out where these fish are going. Once they found a habitat that fish uh, seemed to look like, we would do side scan sonar to try to determine what kind of habitat was there, whether it was aquatic plants, logs, rubble, cobble, whatever. Uh, this work has been done by Point and UWGB and a lot of the tributaries, we're using that information that you get on what kind of, what is good musky spawning habitat. Okay. Once they have identified habitat, they went out there and tried to collect eggs. Uh, they did, and were able to uh, find eggs. And they have been sent off to the lab to be tested genetically to see if they are truly musky eggs or something else. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot more results on that. Moving to some of his very preliminary results, and I will say they are definitely preliminary. These are the results that I picked up from them last, late last year. Uh, they take 56 muskie, 41 who were from an anglers, five who were from our electric fishing boat, and 10 from the pike nets that we set that week before we spawned fish in the box. Uh, the goal is to take four more this spring, so we'll have a total of 60 keg muskie out there. 60% uh, of the muskies they caught and put tags in spawn in the tributary streams, and about 40% spawned in Green Bay proper. Uh, muskies that had known stocking locations, these are the ones that you put pit tags in at the hatchery, spawn in the locations that they were stocked in. So they do seem to have some homing, although it's not a salmon. It's not 90 or 95 percent, it might be 60 or 70 percent. So there does seem to be some relationship where they'll come back to where they were stopped. Uh, they look for eggs at 52 sites. Uh, they had success in finding them at 28 sites, and now they're waiting uh, the genetic testing to see if they're truly musky or not. 110 sites were searched for larvae. Uh, Gray nets, larval turt, light traps, seines, and electrofishing, so they put a lot of work into trying to find larvae. Unfortunately, they only caught two in the Menominee River. Uh, once again, they're sending those fish for genetic testing to verify that they were musky. They certainly look like it from their picture, but time will tell. Okay. And with that, it's the end of my talk, uh, specifically on musky. Any questions before I do one minute? A couple items. First off, um, where are we at as far as natural reproduction on the bay today? 
Uh, our egg production is very low. We find a few fish every year that don't have fin clips. Uh, we're assuming those are naturally reproduced fish. However, uh, over the course of the last three or four years, mu uh, muskie were stocked by the state of Michigan in Baden Knox, uh, Great Lakes muskie, and they unfortunately did not fin clip them. So we could be seeing some of their fish? Could be, but I think if the fish are in Sturgeon Bay area, they're probably naturally reproduced. Yep. But further north, it's a question of fish. Yes, sir. So next spring, when we're assuming that we can take uh, eggs from Elkhart, what's the potential for raising them for stocking numbers, let's say fall of 2020 in the bay? Do you know what numbers we're looking at potentially? I, yeah, I don't know. That will all depend on how many eggs we get. Uh, I'm not holding out much hope for 2020. I've been the, <clears throat> the 2021 advocate just because when the fish we stocked in 2010 were very small. Not very many, and so I'm guessing 2013 might be or 2012, whatever the next year class was, will be the one that will get fish from. They will be raised up while grows. They'll be divided up. Uh, some will go to brood stock, back to brood stock, like the rest will come to natural. Let's stock. say we're 2025, five years, six years out, which is good. And are we looking at 20,000 fish a year, 25? That would be the goal between 20 and 25,000. They won't all be yearlings, though. Right now we're raising about 12,000 and that's pretty much maxing out their outdoor ponds for yearly fish. So 12,000 might be the max right now that we can raise. Although that may change because some of our pond space is being used for the for walleyes with the walleye initiative. And depending on how that goes, there might be additional ponds put in. That's yet to be seen. That's what I was gonna say. What do we what do we have for fishery space? Uh, most well, all the fish that we get from Michigan are way, uh, raised at wild grows. They have four ponds that can raise about 12,000 fish or so. Uh, we can raise about 7,500 fingerling at Kiwani if everything goes well. Generally, you, you've been getting about four or five thousand dollars on the pan. What sorts of fingerling fish or ponds are stocked in locations? Uh, those yearling fish that are uh, raised at Kiwani are all stocked here in Green Bay. Because they're, they're, they're considered production fish because they're, you know, they don't have the wide genetic background that we want to put in blue stock like for a few hundred years. Pretty soon though, uh, if we keep stocking the yearlings in Green Bay, our population is going to be pretty diverse as well. And we may be able to get fish from here as well to supplement whatever we get from the blue stock place. Yes, sir. Uh, right, well, right now, the, the only lake that gets uh, Great Lakes muskie is Winnebago system, you know, Butamore, Little Butamore, Winnebago. Uh, they only get like 500 fish, and they come out of the 12,000 that we get, so they're really not taking up much of our space. And certainly the local clubs down there are happy to see the stuff, you know, because they put in money in, you know, all the, for this program as well. And, that way they have a local source. So the long range goal would be to use Great Lakes muskie in any Great Lakes drainage flow. That's many years away. I mean, that would not only be for Lake Michigan, but that would include uh, drainages in Lake Superior. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, that's what we can raise it while it grows right now, but we're raising all the fish that Michigan will give us. So until we have our own brood stock, uh, 12,000 may be our max. Once we're able to raise uh, all fish from Wisconsin, I, I would guess that we would be stocking out a mix, like I said, of fingerlings and yearling fish, which would put more fish in the water. Yes, sir. That I can't tell you, you're talking to the wrong guy. I'm not the hatchery supervisor. I'm sure if we had money and 
I don't know if they have the space, but we, you know, it's all possible. You know, the, the uh, Patrick person that oversees Kiwani actually was a supervisor at Long Road, so uh, Jesse Landward is the person who comes to, and I'm sure your club has dealt with him in the past. Okay. <laughs> okay. One, uh, one other item regarding diversification of stocking locations. I know that you said a lot of them tend to go back to where they were stocked. We tend to just dump them at a launch. And you know, is there any thought to maybe here or there? You know. Yeah, th and that's a really good question about asking: Do we stock in all the same locations, or we try to spread them around? With the availability of fish, the last three or four years, we've actually added more stocking locations. In the past, we used to stock the Fox River, the Peshtigo, the Menominee, Sawyer Harbor, and Little Sturgeon Bay. Those are our five spots. spots. Uh, this past few years, we've also been stocking uh, more fish in the Peshtigo, the Oconto, the Pensaki. You know, I'm forgetting one. Not the Swamico River. Thank you. Swamico River. Uh, they're also in, our, in, the, in the plan that uh, Dave Rowe and I wrote before he left. Uh, we also are looking for a spot in Dork County, north of Sturgeon Bay. So we're trying to find a spot that would be conducive to muskie, and we're hoping that some of this study by Robert will give us an idea of perhaps where we should look in Dork County. But yes, we are trying to spread <coughs> around. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, good. Another question. Yeah, I was also asked to talk a little bit about pit tag readers. I understand the club has bought a few. I brought uh, one here to show. You go to the next slide. Sure. Uh, generally, you know, uh, what you're going to be doing is working for me, working for pit tags and any fish that you might catch. I don't want to uh, mislead you. There's not going to be a high percentage of fish out there with pit tags in it. There may only be one or two percent of the muskie out there that you catch. That percentage, of course, has been going up every year because when we stock uh, yearling muskie from all those, we've been taking about 20% that go into Green Bay. So uh, we have been putting more tags out recently. Uh, what I have put together here, you can choose to use them or not. Uh, it's up to you. This is a data sheet. Uh, what it is, on the first page, there's the far left-hand column, there's a bunch of dashes. Uh, these tags are either going to be 10-digit alphanumeric, so numbers and letter tags, those are the older tags, or the 15-digit numeric tags, the what we use now. So there's 15 lines here. Please don't give me any 13-digit <laughs> numbers, because that's not going to help me very much. Uh, then we'll ask for a length and a fin clip, and that's why this is up here. Uh, the fin clips that we use on musky mostly are either left fin, fingerling musky, or right fin for yearling stock musky. That just tells us at what age class they were stocked. In the past, there were one year where we clipped both fins, so there'd be a VV clip. And then I think one year they actually clipped, uh, clipped the tip of the max bowl. Uh, that was a very rare. We hardly ever see those. So just record the fin clip. The vast majority of fish you'll see, hopefully you'll have clips. I'm hoping to find some without any clips. That's, that's a plus because all the fish we stock in Green Bay are supposed to be clipped. Um, then the date you catch the fish, and then any sort of uh, comments. Uh, some of these fish are going to have other sorts of tags in them. And if you can look for those tags, I'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, Long orange tags are the loop tags that Robert has used, so these fish are going to probably have a transmitter and they might actually be worth some money. You know, if the money doesn't mean that much to you, just record the number and send it off to Stevens Point. Uh, we have some tags with these Floyd tags on. These are the same sort of tags we take walleyes with. Uh, they're not worth anything, but I certainly appreciate getting a call with the, the number. Uh, there's two sets of numbers on these tags. There's an address. So 2984 is our street address, 2984 Shano Avenue. Please don't call that the tag number. <laughs> we have people telling us that's the tag number all the time. Turn the tag over. It will have 
four or five digit number generally starting with zero. Uh, there are some that have, I think there's seven, eight, and nine with the first digit. And then finally, uh, the tags that you're going to be looking for with your pit tag readers are these, this is a little pit tag. Uh, they're about the size of a grain of rice. Uh, there's two or three different locations you're going to have to scan to find these. All the fish, all, almost all the fish that we tag here in Green Bay are by the dorsal fin, either on the left side or the right side. I'd recommend scanning both sides because they do migrate. Uh, there will be some in the belly between the ventral fins, and very few, very few is, are going to be in the cheek, and that's mainly if you go fish somewhere else, not in Green Bay. A lot of fish are either in the dorsal or between the ventral fins. Uh, one thing I do have is on the back I have a map. It's our grid chart. There's it's a series of numbers. If you can just jot down what grid you caught the fish in. If you want to provide more information, just write it in the, in the uh, comment section. You know, Gale Beach or University Bay, whatever. You know, I don't need a specific lat block just kind of a general idea so we know where these fish were caught. Uh, the pit tag readers themselves are pretty simple. I don't know what brand you've got. It's right here, right on the corner. Okay. Generally, you push the button, <laughs> it will start up and initiate. I'll tell you that it's ready. Uh, you'll, okay, it says ready, so now you can start scanning. You push the button again, you hold it down, until it beeps, either saying no tag found or here's the tag number. You can see what that tag number is. Nine zero 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 six seven. That's a lot of numbers. It's fifteen digits. Yeah. So those are um, really useful for us. I mean, we don't get to see that many muskies. Most of our muskies are either caught during our spring survey on the fox or a fall survey on the fox. So if you're finding fish out in the bay, that be super useful information for us. So I'd really uh, appreciate it. If you would send us that, you can either use my data forms or one of your own, or if you have a log book, that's fine too. But just try to get that basic information down. Tag number, tag date. Length isn't even all that important. Location is very important and date is important. And certainly if you see something on the fish like uh, damaged gills or hook marks on the side, write that in there. That way we can kind of see if that fish ever shows up again. And with that, I have only one more thing to say. What I did is I brought some summary sheets of uh, 2018 data from, from Muskie. I'll leave it here. If you want one, pick it up and take it. Otherwise, uh, thank you for your attention. Unless there's any other questions, have a great night, everybody.